This is the Awful Announcing Podcast. Here's your host, Brandon Contes. All righty, welcome to episode 33 of the Awful Announcing Podcast. I'm your host, Brandon Contes, and this week we have Jamel Hill joining us. Jamel, of course, formerly of ESPN, is currently a contributing writer for The Atlantic. You can also read her memoir, Uphill, catch her appearing on the Dan Lebitard show or CNN. The Pat McAfee show has kept her, like all of us, busy of late, and we're uh, very grateful that Jamel has added our podcast to the pile. So, Jamel, thanks so much for coming on the podcast today. Now, I'll just I'll start by asking, as a former ESPN employee and now a bystander and observer to what's going on, have you been amused watching the recent chaos at ESPN or have things kind of like started to take too big of a right turn to enjoy any part of what's gone on the last week with Pat McAfee, Norby Williamson, Jimmy Kimmel, and Mm -hmm. Aaron Rodgers? Uh, Well, thanks for having me. And I would would probably say it has been over 90% amusement, (laughs) you know, um, and uh, I guess a part of you, you do tend to feel a little bit of relief because a little bit of relief, at least in my case, just because, uh, you know, I'm not there. Um, you know, the, the headaches are not mine. <laughs> they, they belong to somebody else. Uh, but it's just fascinating and, and compelling, uh, frankly, to see how things have so quickly escalated, how things that, you know, when I was there, I could have never imagined I could never have imagined play out this way publicly and to see all of this kind of come together for this uh, cocktail of intrigue has been certainly um, very interesting to watch from afar, particularly uh, considering my history with ESPN and and having spent 12 years there. What do you think the internal conversations are, are like at ESPN as Rogers specifically uses the Pat McAfee show and subsequently uses their own platform to talk about COVID and vaccines and conspiracy theories and and so many things that have nothing to do with football. Well, I think it depends on what group of people you're talking about. I mean, certainly the chatter among the talent is a lot different because now I think there are internally a lot of other people there or people there, you know, who are on the talent side of things who feel like that they're setting some really bad precedents. And, um, I think too, and this tends to be the case anytime something that is internal spills out at ESPN, everybody sort of uses or thinks about examples in which they have may may have been punished or um, they have, they may have received certain directives from company leadership. And then to see them go against all of that. I mean, I, I think they're all wondering what this exactly is ushering in. And this has been a constant conversation at ESPN. It was when I was there, and I'm sure it will exist for many years to come, is different rules for different people. And the reality is is that ESPN, um, because of how talent is generally treated, I don't think they could ever create an equitable system where everybody who commits the same offense or does something that steps outside um, what the company line is or however you want to, what category you want to put that, I don't think they could ever make one cooker-cutty policy cookie cutter policy that could fit everybody. It's just not, it's just kind of impossible. Um, But I do think that there are a lot of people there who feel like there's new and bad precedents being set. Um, And there are a lot of people there who frankly agree with Pat McAfee with some of the things that he's said about ESPN management, particularly Norby Williamson. Um, So I think you have a lot of different feelings and some of this, some of them feel like all of this is embarrassing as well. Is that, uh, here, you know, you platform one of the biggest stars in the NFL and, you know, he's turned it into own network. So it's like, you know, kind of like, what are we what are we doing? And this whole idea of sticking to sports or um, only talking about things within the spectrum of how it relates to sports has been now that argument is on his head because it's like you've allowed this to happen here. Right. And then next time somebody else kind of goes off on a tangent or decides that they want to introduce other topics that are non-sports related into the conversation, it's going to be a lot more pushback and a lot more resistance to that. Should ESPN employees, or I'll, I'll say should all ESPN talent, because Pat technically is not an employee, but should they all be treated equally? Well, I don't know that you can, because, you know, let's just be real about what's life. 
people who tend to earn a lot of money tend to get away with a lot more and there's a lot more leeway. Um, and you know, some of it too is, uh, I think Pat McAfee is, is one of one in terms of his, the type of talent that he is. And I know ESPN is skirting that line of like, well, technically he's not one of us. He's not an employee, but the right. reality is like that. The average person watching doesn't know that. And they see him on your air. They see Aaron Rodgers on your air. And therefore they're associating that with ESPN. Nobody is sitting there saying, what's the pack of Mac McAfee show, but it's really not ESPN's. It's right. like, nobody's going to make that distinction. I mean, they can, they can hide behind that distinction and it will work for them maybe legally <laughs> to some degree, but like that doesn't, that's not how the public is registering this. Um, so, you know, I guess kind of what I would say is that, yeah, I, I think it's pretty impossible to treat everybody the same because the people who are, who make more money, who draw more eyeballs, they're going to have a longer, um, a longer leash and more latitude than people who do not. And, um, it does create a lot of animosity. It does create a lot of problems, but, um, you know, at the same time, I do think that there should be company standards um, that are in, in that are in place that I think imply to apply to everybody. But every situation is different. What people are bringing to the table is different. And I think it would be pretty hard to have a uniform policy of of either discipline or critique that applies fairly to everybody. So e even if there are different rules and different standards for different talent, does McAfee currently give other ESPN employees the the credence to to maybe say something that is potentially controversial. And then if they are approached by a boss or executive about it, they can now point to McAfee and say, wait a second, I, I thought this was okay. Absolutely. And that is, that's the other part that secretly talent hopes happen because then the next time, if you say something that is controversial, that is outside of the realm of what ESPN typically covers, you can always use this example because even though, you know, as I just said a moment ago, it would be impossible to create one uniform, you know, uh, policy in terms of discipline or other things for certain things at ESPN that applies to everybody. But that's not what the company tells you. They tell you everybody is treated the same. So as long as they stand on that business, then anytime somebody uh, does something, be it on an ESPN platform or off one, all right, they are going to be able to say, oh, but what about that time? that you didn't do anything when Pat McAfee did X, Y, Z. I right. mean, even when it comes to something as simple as cursing, I mean, Pat McAfee's cursing, he's got guests that curse. So I'm not saying that other, other shows are going to now suddenly have people who curse. Cause again, I know, you know, it's a, those are different types of shows, but even in say your own personal social media accounts, I mean, they sort of frown upon you cursing on those, but for what? I was like, you got somebody cussing on TV every day. So why, why is my social media feed any different? So those are the kinds of um, uh, conversations and arguments that are probably going to be had. And management isn't going to have a whole lot to stand on because they've allowed these pre these new precedents to be set. How, how do you feel Pat's show fits on ESPN? And has your opinion of, of the show changed in the last um, week or, or 10 days? Well, uh, you know, I... Um, you having watched the show before it was at ESPN. Um, and I can't say I watched it a lot, but I, I'll just say I watched it an, enough, but um, I, I think it does fit. I mean, I, I don't have a problem, you know, with his show or uh, I think there is a part of ESPN um, that realizes that they've got to figure out a way to connect and tap into younger viewers. They've got to figure out a way to tap into to certain cultures in sports. And so he's their conduit to do that. Um, now, you know, I'm a thousand years old. It's not necessarily a show for me <laughs> per se, but that doesn't, that's not an indictment of the content of the show. It's more of an sure. indictment of the fact that I'm a fossil. So <laughs> it's like uh, that, that has more to do with that. But no, I, I, I think that they should welcome new non-traditional voices to ESPN. I mean, I think the energy that Pat McAfee has brought to game day is like pretty unquestionable. Like it, he has brought a really good energy. Um, I enjoy watching him on, on that platform and, um, I'd like to see them give, you know, those kinds of opportunities more routinely than they do to, to people who are kind of, I'd love to one day see uh, a Cameron and uh, Cameron and Mace on ESPN. I'd love to see it. You know what I'm saying? And so like, those are the kinds of new voices that are emerging now in sports media culture. And I think ESPN would be smart to invest in those voices. In the, uh, the hierarchy of, of ESPN, where do you think Pat McAfee ranks or, 
even does does that high price talent outrank executives? Oh yeah, I mean, uh, uh, it, of course it depends on which executive. I mean, yeah, nobody's outranking Bob Iger. Okay, <laughs> like that's that's not gonna happen. But I think you know, or Jimmy Pataro, like, or even Burke Magnus. As like, I think those are like sort of the golden three that you have there. Um, but everybody beyond that. You know, I mean, I think they clearly made a decision with Norby Williamson. He may be valued in the company um, in terms of like, you know, how other executives look at him. I mean, even by some certain certain talent, because he has good relationship with some talent. He just didn't have good relationship with uh, a lot of people. And so um, I think McAfee used his leverage. He pulled his card. He knew exactly what he was doing. Um, he knew who he could piss off and who he couldn't. So um and that's not to suggest he's pissed off at more executives, but I think he knew he could see the long game in this and knew it would turn out in his favor. Now, I think he's becoming a face of ESPN. Like for me, I would consider Stephen A. Smith to be the face of ESPN sure. um, currently. But it is interesting because I've had this conversation with other people at ESPN and just other friends of mine in media. I don't even think Stephen A. Smith could have done what Pat McAfee did. I don't, I don't think he could have. And, um, you know, he and he is as powerful and draws as as many eyeballs as anybody in that place. He's probably the most recognizable ESPN personality. And so but I don't think even he would have the leverage to do something like that. So what? why is it that Pat has that leverage? Is it because of his connections to Bob Iger and Jimmy Pitaro and Burke Magnus? Or is it more because he is not afraid to to leave ESPN if um, if it comes to that? So I think mentality works. And um, Pat McAfee, I think part of what will make him very successful at ESPN is that he doesn't need ESPN. And when you're able to kind of carry that level of fearlessness with you into your content, I think it makes the content, you know, better. And I think it, and to some degree, it makes your experience better there because you have this inner knowledge, like, I don't need to be here. I chose to be here. Right. And that that will, you will navigate much differently based off that. I think Stephen A. Smith loves ESPN and he loves being on ESPN. And that's not to suggest that Stephen A. Smith could not succeed without ESPN. He absolutely could. But I think he has a different relationship with the company than Pat McAfee does. Pat McAfee is new to ESPN. He's new to the culture. Like, I don't think the culture at ESPN means anything to him. Um, just outside looking in, I mean, we've never had that, that certain sure. discussion. And when you know that you don't need them and you know that you could possibly be bigger when you leave there, he's going to be operating and moving differently than a lot of people in there who feel like that they need the ESPN platform. Yeah. I, I think Stephen A absolutely could be successful without ESPN. Um, and he will be whenever it comes to that. But I do think that he still values traditional television uh, more so than, than Pat does at this point. Yeah. I think that's a fair assessment. And um, you know, Stephen A came up as a very traditional journalist in traditional corporate media. So um, I, I think it is part of like sort of an ingrained mentality that he has and a lot of people there have is that, OK, this is kind of the way you do things. ESPN is a legacy um, corp media corporation, and it's also the destination job. And so, like, I, I definitely see, you know, Stephen A having like a much different feeling than right. somebody like Pat McAfee would. Do you think that Pat and Norby Williamson need to have a a cordial relationship for um, them both to have continued tenures at ESPN? Like, is is one capable of getting the other fired? <laughs> I don't know if it'll come to some kind of Hunger Games between the two of them, but I don't think they need to get along for it to work. Um, you know, I think based off setup, um, uh, you know, I don't know how much Norby has to do with his show. So unless he has like a lot of control over his show, and I imagine if it's true that he was a dissenting voice that didn't want Pat McAfee there, then I don't know why he would be. And you wouldn't want somebody in charge of your show that didn't want you there. And right. unfortunately, I had to experience that personally with Norby. So I understand what that is like. And um, so, no, they don't need to get along. I mean, there were plenty I wouldn't say plenty because that puts too big of a number on it. But there were executives that I didn't particularly care for, uh, but they had nothing to do with my show. So we could secretly not like each other and it was fine. Yeah. Um, so the only thing and and for him, as long as he keeps Jimmy Pataro and Burke Magnus as a trump card 
him and Norby can stay as far apart from each other as they need to in order for them both to professionally um, thrive. I think the only way that this escalates to the point where somebody got to go is if the beef between them escalates and more things happen. Um, and certainly if uh, Pat McAfee suspects there's further sab sabotaging of his show from him. Do you think that Pat is is reaching at all by assuming that Norby was leaking ratings and inf information and attempting to to sabotage his show? Like, is is that something that um, was surprising at all to hear him jump to that conclusion? No, it wasn't surprising because there were certain narratives. You know, when when me and when Michael Smith and I, when we were hosting the Six, I mean, we knew when Norby took over our show, he didn't really want us to be the anchors. Um, that. You know, had he had a chance to go back in the in the DeLorean, he never would have chosen us to host the six o'clock show. That doesn't mean that we couldn't have had a successful show in spite of us not being his first choice. But I do think us not being his first choice or being a choice, I should say, um, I think that hurt. I mean, it, it really did. And um, I, I don't think, uh, you know, while there was certainly a, a level of professional respect, I do think the narratives around our show he didn't help to kill those. And I don't know how much he had to do with creating them, but I can say that, um, you know, I certainly had my suspicions, um, especially when it came to certain narratives that our, our show was too political and there were certain decisions he made. I wrote about it in, you know, my memoir is like, you know, we had the personality wall uh, behind us that used to be kind of a signature component of our set. And <laughs> I already knew the, the the picture that bothered him was probably the picture, especially given the climate, uh, was the picture that Mike and I uh, both took with President Obama, who was a, a fan of our show. And we had that on display every day and they made us take all that down. And he was the one who engineered doing that. And, um, you know, other things that got back to us about what he said about us in meetings and, and meeting with other people. We didn't appreciate it. And so when Pat McAfee talked about how narratives are spun about his show and the sabotage, I very when I tweeted, I can relate. That's what I was talking about, um, because people got this idea that our show wasn't about sports when ninety nine point nine percent of the time we talked about sports, sure. <clears throat> we didn't talk about politics. We didn't talk about, you know, we weren't opening the show talking about immigration reform. Uh, seeing where things turn. I was like, shit, I wish we would have, right? <laughs> I was like, maybe we should have started off uh, the, the top of the show, you know, talking about reparations. I don't know. <laughs> I think maybe that might've worked. But um, yeah, I mean, we we felt really undermined at a lot of different points. Um, all of that was not on Norby for sure, but I don't think he helped and I don't think he stopped it. And so um, it was... So I definitely could understand why Pat McAfee would immediately point to him as being somebody uh, knowing that he wasn't a fan, knowing, you know, um, that maybe some things were said internally that we're not privy to that probably got back to Pat, Pat McAfee. And that's probably why he said what he said. So what what value does an executive that would potentially attempt to or not stop the uh, sabotaging of a show, what value does that ex executive have to to ESPN? Well, I mean, Norby's been there a long time and he's worked with a lot of talent. Every relationship has not been easy, but not, all of them haven't been um, bad either. There are people, <laughs> there are talent in the building. They love Norby. Yeah. Like they, they don't have a problem with him at all. And I think that tends to be the case for probably most executives that are in charge of shows. Your experience with the person who kind of oversees your shows is a very individual experience. And I think Norby's value is that he understands ESPN. He, um, he's been there a long time. He knows his history. Um, and, you know, while I, you know, I, I do wonder if non-traditional talents are his strong suit. Like I think he's very traditional thinking in terms of how he thinks about shows and talent and, that's probably not going to go over well with somebody or it's not going to mesh well with somebody like Pat McAfee. I mean, Mike and I were very non-traditional type of talents, you know, and we didn't want to do a cookie cutter sports center. We didn't. And so that, because I think he already had certain ideas of how he wanted sports center to be, what he wanted it to look like. And he didn't, he was, he has been firmly against personality driven sports centers from day one. 
And they, when they asked us to do Sports Center, they wanted a personality driven show. And as I often make the comparison, it's like, you know, the quarterback that gets drafted and, uh, you know, he's a mobile quarterback and goes outside the pocket. And then they, you know, fire the GM and the coordinator and the coach and put in somebody who wants a statuesque uh, po a pocket passer. You know, it's like we don't run the same offense. So, um, so yeah, so I, but I do think there's a lot of people who value his television savvy um, and, and value in some ways how he makes uh, certain talent better. So in the building, Norby has a lot of currency, which is why they have put him in charge of so many things. Were you ever close to um, calling out an e executive on air? Like, is that something that you ever could have imagined doing during your no. time at ESPN? No, even even at the height of the controversy I faced, like that w was never my first, second, third, fourth or fifth thought <laughs> because, uh, you know, that's a no, no. It's like I wasn't going to as upset as I was at the time with certain executives. Um, and, you know, John Skipper and I re remain close. And um, I was I was more hurt by Skipper's response than I was like angry. Yeah. And, I, you know, I, we, we've long mended our, you know, sort of relationship and got past that time. So, you know, it, it's it's certainly not a, a big deal now. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, it just never occurred to me to do that just because as 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 tumultuous as that time was, the reality is I, I had spent 12 years there and they were good to me many and the majority of those years. And it was the best job that I ever had in sports media. And so it would have been disingenuous for me to come out and go on some attack spree, uh, regardless of the emotional turmoil that I was personally feeling and feeling like, um, you know, the company didn't have my back. You... Sorry, I was just bracing for my dogs to, to go crazy <laughs> there. Um, do, you, um, do you think that Pat should take a more journalistic approach to his interviews with Aaron Rodgers or is it okay that he does take take the approach that he's more of an entertainer conducting these interviews in the manner that he does? I don't look at Pat McAfee as a journalist. I do look at him more in the entertainment spectrum, but I do think just even in, even in the scope of entertainment that when, as a host of a show, when Aaron begins to go off on these tangents, I think he's well within his right, if it's his show, to stop them, to say, hey, hold up. You know, uh, and then I'm sure Pat McAfee got the speech that we all get uh, when you're there and you have to go through all the, the seminars and the best practices and they tell you about what defamation is. OK, so he I'm sure has gotten that just like everybody else in the building. And so when Aaron suggested that it would have been a good time for him to just say as a host, not necessarily a journalist, but as a host. And this is your show to say, hey. Or to just get a, or, you know, make it real plain. Are you saying that Jimmy Kimmel is on the Jeffrey Epstein list? Okay, right. so if you're not saying that, then maybe we need to shut this down, right? Like it's he has to get more control of his own show, and that's more of a hosting thing. That's not necessarily a, a journalistic thing when he begins to veer off on these um, on these tangents. And if they're friends, then Aaron will probably receive that pushback better from him than he might from somebody else. Yeah, I think the the only question that I, I do wish that Pat asked Aaron this week particularly is what were you suggesting when you said Jimmy Kimmel probably doesn't want the the Epstein list to be released? Because Rogers and McAfee kind of both leaned on the the backstory of that whole thing in terms of like why Aaron thought to call out Kimmel, but just the 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 fact that he then claimed that he wasn't implying that Kimmel would be on the list. Fine. Th then what were you implying? And that right. question was never asked. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's more, that's again, that's hosting, that's instinct. So these are things that I think, you know, in some ways that uh, Pat McAfee has to see himself as more than an entertainer. He doesn't have to see himself as a journalist, but that is about, you know, controlling what's on and what is happening um, you know, kind of like on your show, because when Aaron Rodgers was explaining, you know, the backstory and it was very convoluted and it sounded very much like I'm immunized. That's what it sounded yeah. like. It was giving that. And it's like, we know you like to play word games. We know you like to kind of um, pretend 
that you're not suggesting something that everybody with ears can clearly understand what you are suggesting. And he could dance around it all he wants, but he literally suggested that somehow Jimmy Kimmel is part of a huge sex trafficking scandal. And that is a no-no. Um, and I know that some people think that it was a deserved response considering how much Jimmy Kimmel has made fun of him. But the thing is, see, that's different. And then people have to understand, like, calling somebody out for their opinion about an issue like uh, vaccinations is a little different than suggesting they're a pedophile. Much different thing. So what does ESPN do now with the uh, the Aaron Rodgers stuff? Like, like do they do they reiterate the stick to sports mandate and 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 follow the we're the worldwide leader in sports mantra, or or do they just kind of ignore it? Because if if they do take Aaron Rodgers off that show or or ask Pat to take Aaron Rodgers off that show, then now you're going to have Aaron going out and and crying that he was censored, which he already did in a sense yesterday while he was still on ESPN. Not in a sense, he said it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he was and being it's, censored. Right. And it's not like on anybody, national TV. I'm right. like, no, nobody ran over and took the microphone away. From right. Him exactly. Like that. Uh, here's what ESPN is going to do. Absolutely nothing. And the reason is that I think they're probably also aware that not only what Aaron Rodgers' response would be, but they probably don't want to make Pat McAfee into a martyr because that would make it even frankly harder. That will give him even more leverage than he already has. Um, because even if people disagree and think Aaron Rodgers is a clown, um, they will see taking him off air or firmly warning McAfee as being um, censorship. And I don't, I wouldn't consider it that, but that is not going to play out publicly in their favor. And I think yeah. they know that. <laughs> and what they're hoping for is that this just goes away. And that, you know, now that he's gotten it out of his system about Jimmy Kimmel, and now that, uh, you know, this kind of probably will die down a little bit after this week, that it can go back to just being jovial and light. Um, and even if Aaron Rodgers chooses, cause I mean, I think the COVID thing is like his thing and he's just going to continue to bang that drum that I, I'm guessing they probably don't consider as problematic as him, uh, taking on Jimmy Kimmel and continuing to insinuate some darker, uh, allegations. What I am curious is about what Jimmy Kimmel is thinking, because he's a pretty highly regarded talent in there too. And he's looking at this. And I'm wondering if he's feeling a little bit of a sense of betrayal because they have allowed somebody to say this about him on television and there was no reprimand and no consequence and no repercussions. And if you're him, you're going to feel away. And so I'm curious as to how that plays out internally. If would would you start a lawsuit, even though no, just knowing how difficult it is to prove defamation, would you hit Aaron Rodgers with a lawsuit anyway, if you were Jimmy Kimmel? Um, you know, I'm, I can be petty. So I probably, I probably would. Um, but more importantly, I think I would probably make it my mission if I were Jimmy Kimmel to get that dude off the air. Um, you know, cause he has a certain amount of weight internally and I would, if I'm him, I'm throwing that around everywhere. And, um, so I could see that, uh, a lawsuit is certainly, uh, much more complex. Uh, but I would not be surprised if Jimmy Kimmel like really kicked that tire and like called a lawyer, called his lawyer and was like, what can we do? And, um, you know, there's part of him that might say like, okay, since ABC, Disney, ESPN, y'all didn't want to handle it. Well, I'm gonna take it into my own hands and we could get even uglier. Who do you think holds more power, G uh, Jimmy Kimmel or, or Pat McAfee? Um, I think the person who doesn't care about walking away has the power and you can make that case for either of them, you know, really, because Jimmy Kimmel has done this a long time. Yeah. I know he loves his late night show. You know, he's very entrenched in that space. Um, so yeah, there, there would be a lot to, to consider, but at this point he's made a lot of money, you know, he's going to be super famous and he could do bigger things uh, after it. So just like Pat McAfee could. So to me, you know, it's a very intriguing, compelling game of chicken. And both of them have reasons not to veer off course. So 
again, to me, whoever's okay with losing the spot and can walk away and be uh, even bigger than they already are, that's the person who has the leverage. Do you think ESPN has quietly removed the stick to sports mandate? Because like it, it was a big deal when Jimmy Pataro first came on that he was kind of trying to get everything to go back to stick to sports. And then now here we are uh, six years later or whatever it is. Um, and, and talking about the things that, uh, that, that are kind of dominating the conversation with led by Aaron Rodgers and, and the Pat McAfee show. The whole disingenuousness of stick to sports is that it's never about the topic. It's always about how people feel about the topic. Right. And so there is a huge sector of people who are anti-vax, as was exposed when we were really in the height and the thick of the pandemic. We're in the middle of a culture war in America in general, uh, grievance culture especially, uh, white conservative grievance culture even more specifically. And so there are certain opinions that people aren't going, that's not going to create the level of outrage uh, that it did maybe five or six years ago. Like, I'm sure if I said what I said about Donald Trump in today's ESPN culture, it would be different because people call Donald Trump a white supremacist like they say in his first name. That is not a new opinion. It's not unique. Okay. Right. And it is commonly said. So there's nothing, there would probably be no fanfare around it because so much has changed. And, but there are certain opinions, though, especially if those opinions um, put, ESPN in the crosshairs of certain kind of viewers, I think those will probably always create a different level of internal reaction than other topics. Um, you know, even so, I don't think they're going to have some stick to sports mandate. I think it's going to be a case by case basis, depending on how the general public feels about the non sports issue that's being expressed and talked about. Yeah, I, I think ESPN should absolutely let its talent veer away from any sort of stick to sports initiative when warranted, but there has to still be some level of consistency on, on the network. Like the, the, the audience has to, to know a little bit about what they're going to get when they tune there and viewers tuning to ESPN the day after the national championship days before the NFL playoffs, as coaches were, were actively getting fired and you tune to ESPN and you're essentially presented with, Alex Jones for an hour. It's like, it, it's, it's not consistent. And, and who is it serving? Because it's not serving the football fans. And honestly, I don't even think it's serving the Pat McAfee show fans at that point. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, um, that's fair. That's a fair criticism because the people, at least, and you know, I've just heard this from people um, who consider themselves to be like regular viewers of his yeah. show is that they're kind of a little bit turned off by it. Yeah. And you know, for, for people who are more casual observers, this is like fun theater. This is like, oh, look at this circus. Oh, look at this car accident. It's a little bit more for them. Um, but, you know, you're right. You do have to, you do owe a certain amount of, um, uh, you, you owe the the people who regularly consume your, comp, uh, your content something different. And that's a decision that Pat has to make is that, am I serving the audience that got me here right. by- <clears throat> Do, by veering off or allowing my guests to veer off into these topics that they probably don't necessarily, um, you know, want to hear. But then, you know, the other the other argument can be made because he's he's fitting. He's firmly in sort of the anti mainstream media, uh, mainstream sports media, uh, you know, bubble. Like there's a there's a lot of people who are you know fans of his who kind of love the fact that he's while on their network challenging the same network. They kind of right. like that. Uh, and, and that feeds the perception that his show is like not for, you know, your traditional sports fans. It's for people who think a little more outside the box, who like the rebellious nature of the show. Um, you know, there's an argument to be made that maybe he is serving them. But I would like to think the majority of people who tune in to see Aaron Rodgers or Pat McAfee want to probably hear about sports. Is there a journalist or an interviewer capable of challenging Aaron Rodgers or is it just like there's no winning in those conversations? Oh, no, Andy absolutely. Like, have. easily. I mean, like, I don't It's it's not an easy, like, especially with some of the things that he, he says about COVID. And as you just brought up earlier, what was a really fair question is like, okay, if you weren't trying to call Jimmy, Pe Jimmy Kimmel a pedophile, what were you calling him? Right. What were you saying? Like, that's just a simple, basic question, right? And so, no, Aaron Rodgers can 
absolutely be challenged. Like even when he said, you know, um, uh, when he was with the Packers that he was immunized. What does that mean? Right. What does immunize mean? Did you take the shot or not? Like it's just, it's just really just yes or no questions. Did you or didn't you? All right. And now you're before us without a mask. What's that about? OK, so like these are there is no you don't have to spend a whole lot of time thinking. It's just when he says certain things, you have to push back and say, OK, but what about this? Um, you know, he said before that he would debate like an immunologist about what he has learned. I'd love to see it. I would love to see it. I would love to see, you know, as much as he rips on Dr. Fauci and, uh, you know, I'm not saying Dr. Fauci is flawless. I'd yeah. love to see it. Would love to see you, Aaron Rodgers, with whatever you have picked up on Google, debate somebody who's been doing it <laughs> for decades. Yeah, I, I asked earlier about the the chaos at ESPN right now. And personally, like I, I admit that I, I enjoy watching it to some extent. Like sports media drama is kind of it's my my guilty pleasure. It's, it's but it's also uh, your business though, too. Yeah, it's right. Like, no, it definitely, know. definitely absolutely <laughs> benefit from it for sure. And I, I, I definitely like, I, I get kind of excited watching those internal plights play out externally, but what, what I, what I don't enjoy is listening to, to Aaron Rodgers. And this is as a, a Jets fan who absolutely hopes that Aaron Rodgers comes back and, and wins the Jets, the Super Bowl. but I don't in, enjoy hearing him rehash tired narratives that the general public kind of moved on from and, and lost interest in years ago. And Rodgers inability to move on has me questioning whether whether he still adds value to the Pat McAfee show at this point, considering the topics that he just is so hell bent on discussing every single week. Yeah. I think you, the part to think about is when is the last time Aaron Rodgers has gone viral for something he said on that show related to sports, right. like some opinion that he had about a quarterback or a team or even his own situation you know, other than probably the what I can remember and, and, you know, correct me if I'm wrong and I'm sure somebody out there knows better would just probably be about his injury and the timetable. Yeah. Like that, that is the, the only thing I can think of. If you're going viral and making more headlines for the things you say that have nothing to do with your expertise, then that should probably say, that should probably tell you something. Yeah. Um, And at this point, I think most people, especially now are probably going to be watching to see, What's the next stupid thing Aaron Rodgers is gonna <clears throat> Aaron Rodgers is gonna say? And I don't know if you want to be in that space either, where people are have this expectation that you're gonna say something dumb. Right. Um, and it's very interesting uh to see how his career will ultimately be regarded. We know he was a brilliant quarterback. Um, although a, a friend of mine has a has a theory about him that part of the reason maybe that we're getting so much uh QAnon Aaron Rodgers is because he only won one Super Bowl. And, you know, if he were Tom Brady and was sitting on seven of them or whatever, that he probably would maybe be a lot happier. Um, yeah. That there's some part of him that feels like his career has not quite lived up to the standard befitting his talent. And now the rest of us have to be subjected to his opinions that have nothing to do, uh, you know, with what he what, with what he does. And, and, you know, I don't want people to to mistake what I'm saying, like, I don't have a problem with athletes speaking out on things that are not related to sports. I am not the stick to sports person. I am not the shut up and dribble person. That is like not, uh, you know, what I stand for. But if you throw it out there and it gets challenged, don't complain that you're canceled. It's just called pushback and accountability. That's right. it. Right. And so when you throw opinions out, as you do, as I do, people challenge them and you have to either defend it or admit you are wrong or, or, or whatever. Um, so, you know, it would be interesting to see how he's regarded when his career is over, because there's a Kanye West element happening here. And, you know, Kanye, we know, brilliant producer, you know, often, I mean, uh, you know, great musician, period, great rapper. People, he's so far removed from that person. People, people remember it, but it's so distant. Now they just look at him and see a clown. Yeah. And I, I feel that's the direction that Aaron Rodgers is headed, is that people are going to... Not necessarily forget, but that's going to be the secondary story to what his career legacy is. And the first thing people are going to think of is this is the guy who spouts conspiracy theories and just says dumb things. So do you, do you think that the attention that the Pat McAfee show is getting off of Aaron Rodgers is still beneficial or or is the current attention kind of 
teetering on, on being damaging to the the Pat McAfee show? I would say it's more beneficial than damaging. Um, you know, I guess the part of it is like, while the train wreck is happening, how many of those viewers are you able to retain who will come back when there's not Aaron Rodgers and who just are, you've made them generally curious about your show and the type of personality that you are. Um, but even though it's created a lot of think pieces and a lot of columns, I mean, I'll have a column out on it uh, soon for the Atlantic. Um, even though it's created some of that conversation, ultimately it feels more beneficial than damaging because the awareness of the show has probably gone through the roof now. And um, I think there's an expectation now and an anticipation that people are going to look at this show like this is where shit hits the fan. <laughs> and that's not necessarily, uh, you know, a bad thing when you're trying to create awareness for your show. Do you think ESPN views it as beneficial? No, they probably don't. <laughs> I mean, they, they, I mean, I, I think it's very borderline for them because I don't think they want a climate or to create a atmosphere where it's okay for talent to go on air and just go in on an executive. Even if that executive has been accused of those things before and, you know, frankly has deserved some of the criticism that, you know, he's received from people. Um, I don't know that they want to create that precedent either. Um, and I'm sure probably Bob Iger doesn't want to create any sort of blueprint where people feel like they can attack people, other talent, you know, from other shows and other parts of the ABC Disney universe. They probably don't. They don't like that part. Um, you know, talent on talent crime is very frowned upon there. And uh, and that's the part of this that I think is making probably the suits very uneasy and very uncomfortable. Do you wish that you had the the freedom when you were at ESPN that McAfee and even Aaron Rodgers to an extent and Stephen A. Smith even appears to have? Oh, yeah. I mean, because the thing is that, you know, the reason why his and hers was such a success is because, uh, you know, and we did it in a fun way, um, obviously, and, the, and those gentlemen have done it in, in fun ways, you know, getting to know the other side of Stephen A. Smith on his YouTube show has been yeah. pretty fascinating. <laughs> uh, I love it. You know, I love it for him because it's showing like a, a different lane that he can be in. Um, but, you know, sometimes there's a penalty you pay for being a little bit ahead of your time. And a lot of the things that we were doing, people do now, which I find to be, you know, fascinating. But then, you know, ESPN was in a very traditional mindset of how they wanted shows to be. Um, me and a producer who used to work at ESPN, we talked about this when McAfee's show first got on there because when um, we were thinking about um, sort of what the, the six o'clock sports center should be, we, what we originally wanted was something kind of that looked like that. And um, that was loose, engaging. I mean, we didn't even think cursing was an option, so we didn't. <laughs> we we never pitched that part of it, uh, for sure. But like, we did not want to do a traditional, you know, sports center. But I don't think the company or the audience was ready for it. And uh, now that you've seen so many different types of shows digitally become as a success, something like Pat McAfee, as I mentioned, you know, Cameron and Mace and even athletes with their, you know, podcasts that they have, even Shannon Sharp with the yeah. nightcap with Chad Ochocinco, like that is now becoming more of the norm is these relaxed, you know, let's just kick it type of, you know, flow in terms of talking about sports and they just weren't there then. And so now that they're there now, like now it would be, it would be much different. Um, especially, you know, coming from a, a, you know, a woman, cause they don't really have any women in that position driving that kind of content. So uh, even for, you know, my good friend, Dan Labertard, like his show fits more now on ESPN than it did when it was there. Right. You know, because I could easily imagine a power hour of Pat McAfee and Dan Labertard. Like that's giving people that sort of off the beaten path, funny, entertaining, you know, content that I, I think a lot of sports fans like. And so, um, so yeah, like, uh, I mean, definitely, I think his and hers would fit a lot different in the model now than it did then. So as those digital shows and, and athletes and non-traditional media gain a, a larger presence in sports media now, where is the value for traditional journalism and, and journalists still on ESPN? 
I like to think it's room for everybody because uh, technically I think it is because I do one of the the heartbreaks for me is seeing how journalism like what outside the lines does on a or, or did I should say on a regular basis seeing that kind of type of journalism being phased out because they're still even though it's sports even though it's games results you know we're not talking about you know saving uh, babies from burning buildings I, I get that but there's still a power structure in sports that needs to be challenged all the time. And uh, that part of, and that component is missing. And as much as I love the growth of sports media in terms of welcoming in different types of voices and uh, different types of content and even what it looks like, um, it is in many ways, um, it is putting the traditional journalists on the ropes. It's like, we still need people who can ask questions. We still need people who can, do the basic functions uh, uh, of the job. And um, as it veers more heavily veers more towards entertainment, the journalism part is going to be lost. And uh, I'd like to see ESPN still continue to invest in that kind of journalism. It feels like it's getting less and less. You can't save everything for 30 for 30. You know, I, I think there's got to be some regular <laughs> mechanism in which the structures of sports um, and the questions in sports, you know, can be asked that are, are harder and more difficult. You had, um, you mentioned earlier that uh, SC six was, was kind of pitched to you as personality driven sports center. At what point when you, during, during your tenure anchoring that show and hosting that show with Michael Smith, did you realize that ESPN did not actually want a personality driven sports center? Oh, well, <laughs> Well, I'll say this, because um, uh, that question almost deserves uh, two answers. Um, I knew before we ever had our first show that we were not in a good place. Okay. Um, and uh, the reason is because I didn't feel like we had enough time to figure out what the show was. I mean, his and hers ended in late December, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And then we we wound up doing a special his and hers in January um, to support the, um, uh, the college football playoff, I think. Um, and... So we had maybe four or five rehearsals, <laughs> you know, before we had, and then we went on this monstrous publicity campaign that ate up a lot of time. So when it came time to actually work on the show, we had very little time. And I know that they were trying to take advantage of the window after the Super Bowl, because usually those tend to be the highest rated shows across yeah. the network. <clears throat> and they wanted us to debut then, and they were insistent about it. I personally prefer a fall debut. Uh, around NFL season because I thought we needed that much time to work and looking at how SVP, he got a long time to work on his show, get up, got a long time to work on that show. I was like, I don't, I don't feel good about this. Um, so from the start, uh, as, as, as much as everybody was on the same page about making the show a success, about it being personality driven, um, we hadn't figured out how that could work in the universe of traditional sports center. And so a lot of, the tinkering and the changing and the formatting, all that happened in real time. And that was not good for the show, particularly since we had a whole ad campaign that falsely led people to believe that the show was not about sports. Um, I think that was a huge mistake. It was an ad campaign Mike and I really weren't thrilled about, um, but we did it because we wanted to be good soldiers and you know, we kind of trusted them and thinking like, well, they've been doing sports center a long time. This is really our first experience. So they probably know what they're talking about. And in hindsight, that was not a good idea. Um, so there was that part. And then, you know, Norby sort of took over uh, maybe five or six months um, that we were into it. And he wanted to go back to traditional sports center. And so all the personality elements that they said they wanted were removed. <laughs> and so um, even, you know, our screen time together, you know, it was, it was removed. And so, um, uh, you know, we were in two separate parts of the studio, you know, doing our reads and interviews. And so like the thing that people loved about us, which was our chemistry with each other, they sort of sucked out of the show. And so it was, um, you know, it, it, we were under two different regimes at two different times. And uh, in both cases, we were not on the same page. Whose idea was that ad campaign? Uh, it was actually Skipper's idea. Because <laughs> he, um, I know the the original, I remember the original concept that um, the, that marketing came up with 
um, he thought it was too tame, actually. And I'm trying to remember what it was, but he wasn't a fan. And he was like, no, it needs to be more, you know. And then next thing you know, uh, I'm dressing up like James Harden and um, uh, Cleopatra Jones and, and, you know, and the the the, the campaign, I, you know, I, I believe the um, the slogan it was like movies, music, and more. But we're talking about Sports Center. We weren't giving music <laughs> reviews. We weren't giving movie reviews. Like, so I think I get I get it, it. It came from a good place because when we were on his and hers, we did the skits. All those went viral. They were very well liked around the company and certainly outside. Like people love the cultural elements, and they were just trying to play that up, right? But at the end of the day, people have a different expectation for the six o'clock sports center. Yeah. I mean, it's one of the most difficult time slots you have because it's after sports has been baking overnight and has been talked about all day. And then you haven't played the games yet for the for the night to come. So you're stuck in like this universe of have they already seen this? And we have to also tell them what they're about to see. Um, and so I just don't think we thought about the repercussions, you know, of that. Um, and um, it was, it put, it planted in everybody's mind that our show wasn't about sports. And even now when people are like, oh, your show, it was never about sports. It was too political. We did not do one political topic on that show. We didn't. I mean, they brought, they must've brought us the Colin, Kaep uh, Colin Kaepernick topic. Every time another quarterback got signed, they wanted us to do it. And we were like, nope, nope. And not because we were afraid to do it. We're just like, we're kind of we're past that in terms right. of not his situation, but it's like, why? And I'm not gonna lie, part of us wondered, like, do y'all go to White House and ask them to talk about Colin Kaepernick all the time? I'm being real, like, because why are you continually asking us to talk about Colin Kaepernick? You know, like, certainly we both uh, supported his protest, and we had we had done many topics when we were on his nerves about Colin Kaepernick, but it just felt like, why are y'all doing this? And then, you know, there were some things that happened on the show that didn't have anything to do with us. Like, I, I remember the whole uh, nickname of Woke Center came about because of something one of our guests wore. We didn't have anything to do with that. Like, we didn't tell her what to wear, and it's not our job to do that. Because uh, the, the wonderful director, Gina Prince-Bythewood, wore a shirt that said feminist while we did an interview with her and Sanaa Lathan to talk about the um, anniversary of love and basketball. And she had a new series that, come, that was coming out that we asked her about that was... Um, about uh, a cop shooting a, a unarmed person, but you know the flip was the, the cop was black and the I think the, the the person they shot was white and the reverberations from that. But they started attaching labels to our show that yeah. really were just because we were two black people on TV and right. not be based off the actual content. Yeah, definitely. You were not doing uh, sixty minutes of cable news every single no. night. There um, <laughs> is is that a narrative that you were trying to push back on is it a narrative that you can push back on or like once the show is deemed political is there they're not really a way to it to wasn't really it? a way that we could really fight against it now granted and that was you know something that i think in, uh, upset us that we internally definitely brought to their attention like these narratives are killing us like yeah. what are we doing <laughs> to combat this is there something to be done done and they just kind of made it seem like it wasn't a big deal. Like, oh, but they didn't hear what we were hearing. Right. I don't think they really were as close to it. And maybe, yeah, you could argue that we were being more sensitive about it because it's our names on the show. It's our faces every night that people are seeing. And, um, you know, we didn't we didn't enjoy that. Like, uh, and I wish looking back on it now, I wish that I would have personally, um, you know, maybe fought much harder to get them to do something more actionable to help really destroy that narrative that our show was not about sports. Um, you know, that any, any, any discussion that took place that was not strictly results in games and championships was probably something that was definitely in the news. Like we weren't veering off you know, very much. I mean, one time that we did veer off, like, you know, um, when the layoffs happened at ESPN and and because so many of our friends were part of those layoffs and people we really respected, we um, we talked about it on air and um, which they knew we were going to do. Our mistake was we talked about it too long. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. We, like, we, we did that. And uh, something Skipper had a discussion with us about, uh, for sure. And, you know, he was right. And uh, 
But other than that, I mean, those that's the only time I really remember us like going way beyond um, any kind of, you know, sports discussion. So but yeah, I, I wish those narratives had been a race sooner um, or tried to. But like, you know, during that time, it wasn't just our show, but it was the fact that, you know, between us and Levitar, like as the faces of ESPN start to change, the, the network itself was under attack by a lot of, you know, right wing media outlets and right wing pundits who who saw ESPN as very low hanging fruit. They made them polarizing. You know, they sort of kind of it seemed like they had it out for the network since, um, you know, they decided to give the Arthur Ashe Award to Caitlyn Jenner, which I, I always find to be very fascinating because Caitlyn Jenner is a huge conservative. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, look at that. You know what I'm saying? And so but they use that as evidence that this network has lost its mind and is super woke and all this other dumb shit that they kept saying. And those narratives, you know, ESPN, despite the fact that it's a big company, despite the fact that, you know, it's been very dominant in its genre, it's still a sensitive company, very much so. And those kind of external criticisms do take root in the building. And I think they tried to overcorrect um, because they were so sensitive to it. And uh, I think that just made it worse. That just let the people that just let the people who are loud and dumb know that they could have an impact. Do you think the uh, that SC six was hurt by the Sports Center brand or hurt by the six o'clock time slot? Like, would it have worked better if it was SC eleven and in Scott Van Pelt's time slot? Oh, I mean, you know, uh, I love Scott, uh, but uh, if you'd have gave me opportunity to trade with him, I'd have traded with him <laughs> because you're coming off the games, so you have a built-in huge audience that's coming every night. So you you know because of based off the time slot you already have an idea of what the show is. It's like, yeah. okay, we got to get to these results. We're just coming off a game. You have, if especially if you have an incredible lead in, um, you know, like he had the college football championship as a lead in, like that right. is insanely good. You know, um, I know people like getting back to McAfee for a second that, you know, that uh, in the story about his ratings, they talked about how he can't hold first takes number is very few shows <laughs> that can hold the number before you very few shows. Um, and that was one of our challenges with the six is that they wanted us to hold PTI's number. PTI has a massive number. All right. That's hard to do. And, um, especially at six o'clock, uh, when again, you don't have a fresh result that you're coming off of. Yeah. You may every now and right. again, uh, you might get some golf or you might get some daytime baseball. Like, yeah, that'll, that'll, that'll give you a boost, but it's, but it's hard. Uh, it's a much I was naive to how hard that time slot is is to maintain. Uh, two more things I want to get to before before we finish up. Um, there are not many people who have the the power or the influence to to rankle a sitting U.S. president, and I, I'm sure there was plenty of backlash to calling Trump a white supremacist when you did it, and that wasn't necessarily fun. But were you ever able to take? any semblance of pride in the fact that your words mattered so much? Yeah, um, I did. Um, and, you know, it, it, I think as a, just as a journalist, um, and I've been a journalism nerd my whole, my whole life. It's the only profession I've ever had uh, and ever done. It's the only one I've ever really been interested in doing. The, every journalist um, dreams of the day where you can upset City Hall. Right. And and not on anything frivolous, but on something that is is worth it, that you feel like is for the public good. Right. And so from that standpoint, it was like, OK, a lot of people took the words to heart or at least even the ones that don't agree. I at least made them think, well, is he a white supremacist? <laughs> you know, like they had to at least do a check to be like, well, <laughs> maybe. OK, you know, or at least think about it. So there's something, you know, very powerful um, in that, but I, I will continue to stand on the fact that it's the most unoriginal criticism of anybody I've ever had. Uh, and I was not the necessarily the first to say it. I may have been the first with that kind of platform to say it, um, for sure. But, you know, um, and, but it's also, it, it's a weird thing because I, I, you know, I'm on some level, you know, pleased that it brought a new level of discourse to, um, you know, our conversations as a country. And the other hand, the, the downside is that 
it became a career definer. And I, I can't have that define my career. Like my career has spanned almost three decades. You know, I've been in this game a long time. I had a, a wonderful newspaper career um, covering sports. And uh, there's a part of me that's a little bit, I don't know if sad is the right word, but a little disheartened by the fact that for a lot of people, my career started and stopped there. And it's like, uh, it's kind of a lot that's happened outside of that. So, you know, it's one of those things that, um, you know, you live with. I mean, and I don't think it's been negative. So I don't I don't want people to, th to think that, um, you know, I'm having some kind of pity party for myself. But sure. I think given how hard I have worked to be in this job, that if it boiled down to a tweet, I would be really disappointed in my career. Was there, has there been any re regret to, to sending that tweet? Oh, no. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't regret it. Uh, even knowing everything that would come as part of it. Because honestly, it led me to being able to live a life I had not even dreamed for myself. You know, I live in Los Angeles now, a city I've always really liked. Warm weather all the time, which is something I definitely wanted. You know, I'm married. I have a wonderful husband. And um, I just, and now I'm able to do projects a la carte and really tap into my storytelling, um, you know, leading to a different part of my career I never imagined, like doing a lot of behind the camera stuff. You know, I'm executive producing Colin Kaepernick's documentary, which is uh, will be on ESPN. It's a 30 for 30 directed by Spike Lee. That is not a position I would have been in if not for that tweet more than likely. Um, you know, I'm also doing um, some consulting producing on Simone, Bi Simone Biles' uh, Netflix docuseries that's coming out um, in, in the summer. And uh, I just recently narrated a wonderful um, podcast series that I think is coming out either this month or next month. Um, about the rise of the black athlete um, called Shadow Ball. And I'm really excited about that. So these are things and pathways in my career that I don't think would have happened if that tweet doesn't happen, because sure. I probably <laughs> still would have stayed at ESPN. It's a very hard job to leave. Yeah, uh, It's the place that people dream of being and fi uh, starting, finishing, or in the middle of their career, like at any point, you know, it's sort of the sports journalist dream to be there for a lot of people. So um, I'm happy for the disruption because of the things that came after that. In your memoir, you wrote that you were uh, at one point in the running to become Skip Bayless's partner on First Take. Is that an opportunity that you would have um, liked to have? Um, No. You know, I mean, it's funny. It's like they always say that is that the things you think are for you are not really for you. And that wasn't for me. And I very much understood it. Well, I mean, think of it like at that point in my career, at least the way it was told to me and, you know, who knows, like sometimes people just tell you shit just to make you feel better. But it was supposed to be down between me and Stephen A. Smith. Stephen A. Smith made a lot more sense than I did because, you know, during that time when they were rotating different people, different days of the week, there was an electricity and a chemistry they had that was by far the best of all of the the people who were in that rotation and so it just it just made a lot of sense and I think um had I gone that pathway seeing where Stephen A is I don't know if I would have been able to take my career as high as Stephen A did uh with him being in that role I'm not sure I would have lasted as long as Stephen A did in that position um so you know that they always say like you know what's for you is for you and every opportunity is not necessarily your opportunity at the time I thought it was. Yeah. But it, it didn't take very long after that for me to realize, like, that really wasn't for me. I mean, it's the same with hosting uh, First Take, you know, because for a brief period, they were considering um, me to, to host before they hired Carrie Champion. And Carrie was phenomenal in that role. That role was not for me. And um, so these little forks and these things happen in your career where at the time you feel like, oh, yeah, I could do that. You being able to do it is not the same as it being something that really is sustainable or really is something that is going to get your career to another level. So uh, as I'm grateful for the chances I've gotten, but I might be more grateful for the chances I didn't get. Did you have a good um, working relationship with Skip? 
I did. Yeah, I, I did. I had a good relationship um, with him for a time. And um, unfortunately, probably toward the end of his time, our relationship was not so good because uh, I was vocal about how I felt like uh, he was treating Carrie, who became one of my best friends. She was a bridesmaid in my wedding. And I sometimes didn't really like what I saw on air. And, um, you know, there were certain discussions that they had on that show. And, uh, you know, I was also kind of privy to some things that were happening behind the scenes. And Skip is somebody who's very big on loyalty. And uh, so we did not, our relationship when he was at ESPN and, you know, as he was leaving toward the end, did not end on a good note. Did you like the sort of discourse that first take features? Like, do do you enjoy that sports debate? It's not for me, <laughs> not all of that, but you know, again, I'm a thousand man. Like it's like, it's not an indictment of the content. I sure, love no, seeing... definitely not. It's definitely, it's, it takes a, a certain type of talent and, and person to be able to do that every single day for, for several hours. Yeah. I mean, which is why, like, you know, I know that there sometimes can be polarizing opinions about Stephen A, but like, I don't think people understand the degree of difficulty yeah. of what he does is that any daily sports show, um, cause I look back now, like we, I mean, I was on TV for five straight years. That's hard. I mean, it, I didn't realize how hard it was till I left. I was like, Ooh, that was crazy. What was, <laughs> you know? Um, but you know what I'm really happy about when I see first take, uh, is so many of the friends that I came up with in this business or friends who were like younger than me, like seeing somebody like Kimberly Martin, like I've known Kim since. She was um, a, a reporter in New York, right? Yep. When she was just a print reporter. And to see where she is now, like, I love that. I've known Malika Andrews since she was a reporter in Chicago. To see her now hosting her own daily show, those are the things that give me joy. Um, Ryan Clark, I remember when he first got to ESPN. And now to see him just become such an incredibly versatile television personality, that's what gives me joy. And um, so I root for all of my friends that are ESPN um, because I know how hard it is to get real estate there and to be noticed and to to get traction. It's hard. There's a lot of really talented people that work there and there's only so much room. And um, to see, you know, where they started day one and to see where they are now, I think that's like really, really powerful, you know, for me. So when I see these different personalities coming in and out of a first take, when I you know, glance at the show. It's just like, wow, I remember when this, and it's, it's, uh, for me, that's, that's a real bright spot. So what do you think of the role that Stephen A. Smith and, and Skip Bayless have had in sort of crafting the debate culture of sports television and, and even of, of cable news as well? Well, I, I think there's a lot of people who try to borrow from what they did and most people are not very successful at it. Um, it doesn't hit the same, but, uh, I think, it, you know, uh, I used to always make this joke about producers, which they didn't particularly appreciate, is that they, you know, they're really good copiers. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like nobody wants to be the first one out there with a new idea. It's like everybody right. wants to see how everybody else works it and then see what happens. Because, you know, it's, it's funny. Um, before Mike and I were put together, you know, as, as a team, it's something we wanted because we were like, fr you know, friends in real life and we felt like we had a good chemistry. The biggest pushback that we got was that at the time, everybody wanted white guy, black guy because of PTI, you know? And I I think First Take benefited from that because you got, optically, people feel like they're different, you know? And I always say like the running, the the great irony of PTI is that Mike and Tony are the same person. <laughs> they're just different races. <laughs> they're both, they both cover, both phenomenal journalists who have covered sports since they were practically out the womb and both cranky as hell. They the same dude, <laughs> you know? And I say that with great affection for both of them. And um, so, you know, obviously once Stephen A and Skip uh, came along because they're bombastic personalities, they, I think, empowered a lot of people to um, bring a different kind of energy to sports debate. And um, that, to me, you can see it, like even even in these new, you know, digital shows and different platforms and, and even with athletes who are now, you know, engaging in sports media, like you see the vestiges of Skip and Stephen A. 
you know, for sure. Like Cameron and Mace, I see first take, <laughs> but just raw and a lot more cuss words. And they really <laughs> veer off topic uh, for sure. But like the rawness that I think first take gay that that show has kind of gave permission to a lot of different um, other sports shows to do it. I mean, even, you know, with, with, with Shannon, like I, I remember when Shannon was first like really getting into sports media and he, you know, he came through ESPN a, a few times and um, it was interesting then because the executives were not, it, it, you know, they weren't, I don't think they were really feeling him that first time. And he's not that much different than he is now. I mean, he, sure. of course he's gotten better because, you know, more reps always makes you better, but you know, it's just funny how, uh, and it happens. It's like, what, what is turn somebody off one year, the next year, they all about it. And, um, even with undisputed, that's what they were trying to recreate. They were trying to recreate skipping Stephen A to some degree. Yep. So <laughs> you see the influence that it has and it's powerful. Um, but I just wish that people understood that not everybody can do that and nor should everybody try and that there's room for different types of sports conversation and debate that all doesn't have to look the same, you know, cause one of the pet peeves that we used to have when we had his and hers, because we followed them uh, for all of first take is that people used to say we were just like first take. And I was like, I don't know what show you watching. We are not like them. And that was no disrespect to them. It's just that we wanted to be firmly and comfortably in our own lane. And we hated being compared to them. Jamel, you were great. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. I really appreciate it. All right. Thanks for having me anytime. That is Jamel Hill. I'm Brandon Contis. This is the Awful Announcing Podcast. Please rate and subscribe to this podcast. Please also subscribe to Awful Announcing's YouTube page. But regardless of how you consume Awful Announcing and the Awful Announcing Podcast, thanks for listening and be good. Thanks for listening to the Awful Announcing Podcast. For the latest news spanning the sports media landscape and more, check out awfulannouncing.com and follow us at Awful Announcing. <laughs>